So you may be wondering what in the world that has to do with prayer. Uh, well, I could say that I'm going to change gears and just preach through the entire Bible this morning, but uh, I won't do that. But what you will start to see me do periodically, that was actually just a, uh, a trailer from a video series off of Right Now Media. And so I'm going to just read the description there. I want to just continue to encourage you guys to use that, especially if we find ourselves um, in the state where we are feeling like um, movement and gathering together is not as easy um, as it has been in other times. So here's this description of this. It, it was entitled Long Story Short. It says, it simply strips the book, the story of the Bible back to its core and presents the story in a way that is accessible to everyone. It's about discovering the heartbeat of the Bible. And so, that I, this is a series that I have added on to the First Baptist link on the Right Now Media page. And if that, if you hear that and say, what does that mean? What does the right First Baptist Church link mean? Let me know, because I can direct you. There's a series of links along the left side of the page, and one of them is the First Baptist Church. And so what you're going to continue to see if you're participating in some of these things is, Periodically, I'm going to be adding different studies, recommended studies that say, you know, consider this. And it may not be for you. This, this study, I, I, I've watched about two-thirds of it. I've got a little bit more to finish. This may be a study that you say to someone who is not a traditional churchgoer. And say, you know, let's try digging in it. Or go dig in with them and say, let's go through this together. So just... Like I said, don't be surprised periodically as you see some of these clips wondering, what in the world does that have to do with anything? You know, are we, do, are we really going to do an 11-part series this morning? Well, I've got, you know, 30 minutes or so. I, we'll see how quick I can be. But, um, so let's move on now today to our, our, our scripture. And it's found in the book of Acts, chapter 4. And we're going to pick up in verse 19, which is kind of an awkward spot to start just because of the... the the beginning of the verse. It's kind of in the middle of this story. Uh, but Peter and John are in front of the Pharisees. And so here is their response. Again, I encourage you maybe, maybe later on to back up a, a little bit and read a bit more, but I chose to start at 19 today. So Peter and John answered the Pharisees, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And because, and when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom the sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they said it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them? Who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The king of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hands to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, I have to just reference this. I don't have this in my notes. But I always find this passage mildly, mildly uh, funny when you run into the part where he says, they were amazed because the man was more than 40 years old. So, signs of the times a little bit. And, um, you know, we need to, to not take uh, any moments for granted about the healing work of our, our Lord. 
So my sermon in a sentence this week is this. And so again, if you're not aware of this, this is meant to be a summary of the sermon that you can take with you because, as I've said many times, you can try as hard as you will. You will not remember everything that I say. Uh, and so take this as a focus point. This is something that you can write down, carry with you, and, and hand off to someone or just share. This is what we talked a little bit about on Sunday. It is this. If the glory of God through the salvation of sinners is what we desire, then this is how we must pray. So we've talked a lot about the when, the why, the what. We actually did a little bit of the how. We, if you remember, we preached off of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, but I think there's also something to learn from a story such as this. Now, isn't it interesting what Peter and John did upon their release? They did something very natural. And then they do some other things that are very supernatural. What do you think you would do if you were released from prison or from uh, you know, just being held? They went to their friends. Now you maybe say, I go to my family, whatever that may be. They did a very natural act. But the supernatural thing that they chose to do was to pray. And not just how they prayed, or not that, this, how, that they prayed, but how they prayed and the result of that prayer. As we speak this morning, I want you to notice that there's going to be five points. The first one is this natural response about them going to their friends, and the other four are going to be the supernatural response that occurs. And so the first thing that we read in the text this morning is about being the people of missional prayer. As I've already stated, when Peter and John were released, they went to their friends. They were threatened by the highest Jewish court, and yet they chose afterwards to return to their friends. This is an understandable step. right? We all need friends. We all need a place that feels like home. We all need a group of people that we feel like, even as life has beaten us up, we can find comfort and healing. The word that's translated friends here also means their own. That's the people of missional prayer. Their own people. They went to the people that knew them. Now, who is this? Who are these people? This is the church. This is the believers gathered together. This is more than likely the group of 120 believers that gathered together at Pentecost, and maybe a few others in addition. So where did they go? They went to the church. It makes sense that they went back to them to give them a report. It's not just that they had some interesting story to share about their imprisonment and release, but they needed to tell the church, listen, those who are classify themselves as in charge of Judaism have handed down this decree, and they're telling us that we are not to proclaim the name of Jesus anymore. And they threatened us. This prayer is very relevant to us this morning because... We are friends, are we not? Now, some of our friendships go back longer than others. Some of those friendships are stronger than others. But are we not referred to as brothers and sisters in Christ? We are a spiritual family. We are connected together. And so it should be natural in per particularly in times of conflict and oppression and persecution and opposition, that we should press in towards those relationships, towards encouragement and support. It's natural to want some sense of normalcy in this time where, uh, in many ways, feels so abnormal. 
But it's the supernatural aspect here that we need to focus on. Notice that their first impulse in the midst of all of this, the threats of their lives, was not to whine nor revolt, not to plot, but to pray. And that leads me to my second point, the passion of missional prayer. And in our text this morning we read, And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God. Don't you wish you were like this? Something scares you or startles you and catches you off guard, and the very first impulse is to pray. Something unexpected or threatening comes your way, and your first impulse is to pray. That's what they did. If you find yourself facing an obstacle or opposition, pray. Now I say this is the passion of missional prayers because of one word in verse 24. I'm probably going to butcher this pronunciation, but the Greek word here is Humathomodon, so if anybody can say that better, feel free. But the word is used 12 times in the New Testament. Ten of those times is in the book of Acts by Luke. It's a compound word of the word humo, which means together, and thumos, which means to rush along with. Wrath, fierceness, or passion. And so the best way to understand this word is that they rushed along with passionate prayer. Here's how one Greek scholar described the word. The image is almost musical. I've never actually been, besides a school band concert, I've never been to an orchestra before, but if you have, maybe you can picture this. A number of notes are sounded together. While while the notes are different, they harmonize in pitch and in tone. And as the instruments of this great concert, under the direction of the concert master, so the Holy Spirit guides and directs and blends our lives together. So that's the people and the passion of missional prayer. They lift their voices together to God in passionate prayer. But what did they pray for? I've mentioned this already in previous weeks. What did they pray for? It was, the content was a passionate, united, spirit-inspired prayer to God. They prayed for boldness, that their message be carried out. They didn't pray asking God to never uh, cause them to face persecution again or trials. So we get to point three, the praise of missional prayer. And in verse 24, um, verses 24 through 30, there's seven verses there. And I want you to know, we're not going to reread those right now. But it's interesting that five of those seven verses are about praise. Five sevenths. So for those of you that aren't very good at fractions, five-sevenths of the verses, that's a lot, that's the majority, it's over half, of the verses in their prayer, after what they just faced, are praise. When you come to God, always begin your prayer with praise and adoration. That's how Jesus taught us to pray. Remember, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's praise. We're hallowing the name of God. Now last week, maybe you noticed, I put in like a, you know, I guess maybe I'll call it a turkey. It was a hand frame, but I don't know if the turkey is around Thanksgiving season, about one method with which sometimes people use to kind of keep their prayers somewhat organized, which for someone like me is helpful. It's helpful to have an organizational system, a plan as to how I'm going to pray, while still allowing space for the Spirit to lead. 
So maybe you've used the Acts acrostic, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Or you've maybe used the, the, uh, the word pray, praise, repent, ask, yield. Regardless of whether you use one of those or something else, it's important to not just rush in with our laundry list of needs and concerns. I've said this, I think, both of the last two weeks. Praying for each other and the needs, praying for the, the people is vital and important. And yet the time we spend there ought to be no more than our prayer that's designated towards us asking God to give us boldness. Asking us to do his will and to show us and to, and to reveal to us and to help us to see these God sightings. What he's at work at in our lives. But spend time. We need it desperately in this time. Spend time praising God. Now, here's what I want you to consider. They've just been threatened by the Sanhedrin. And I've, as I've already mentioned, they come together to pray for boldness in their witness. And yet they spend five-sevenths of their prayer not praying for boldness, but praising God for who he is. Why do you think they do that? Here's why. There's one other statement that I want you to, to and maybe you will have to write this one down. I should have put this up. I did not. But here's why. Timid Christians have a tiny God. Okay, let me say that again. Timid Christians have a tiny God. Bold Christians have a big God. Tiny Christians have a tiny, or I'm sorry, timid Christians have a tiny God. Bold Christians have a big God. Now, why would they repeat all this? I mean, God knows that, right? Maybe you've had that argument when, maybe with yourself when you were a kid, or maybe even as an adult. Why do we pray these things if God already knows this? You know, do I ask my kids every single time that they come up here to, you know, or come up to, to me to, to say things, you know, whatever a few good things there are that they see in me, do I ask them every time to do that? No, I don't. So why do we do that? Is it because God needs to hear it? No, we know that God doesn't forget who he is, but we are quick to forget who he is. God doesn't need to be reminded of who he is, but we need to be reminded of who he is. Let's be honest with ourselves. We can say, yes, this is who God is. This is who God is. This is who God is. List off any of the doctrinal characteristics with which we've maybe been taught about who God is. And then something happens in life. Frankly, oftentimes it's something so insignificant when we look back at it. And yet we lose sight of who God is. We live in denial of the very thing with which we just said God is. So we need that reminder. We need to speak it. We need to confess it. We need to proclaim it. Sing it. Preach it. And pray it. What can we praise God for? Maybe you're finding yourself this morning thinking, I don't have anything to praise God for. I'm in the midst of this tremendous trials. And I can't see how God is possibly using this. You know, you sit there and tell me, Pastor Aaron, that God is using this for my good, but I don't see it. I've been there. I understand exactly what you're talking about. But we need to learn from what the apostles prayed for here. There are four things that they praised God for in this prayer. And I believe we need to pray these things too if we are going to be a church that's seeking to do God's mission. If we're going to have an impact in our community and in this world for Christ, we must pray these things because bold Christians have a big God. Praise God. Here they are. Four, his sovereign control. 
his supernatural creation, his special revelation, that is, how God communicates to us through the word, and his saving cross. Fourth, in missional prayer, we have the petition of prayer. So after declaring these theological truths that Peter and, J Peter and John do, they praise God. They petition our great God in the last two verses. Pick it up in verse 30. And now look, and now Lord, look upon their threats and grant your servants to continue to speak the word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal. And signs and wonders are performed in your name, in the name of your holy servant, Jesus. This prayer goes in the exact opposite way of the command that they were given to the, by the Sanhedrin. Remember, they were told, stop preaching the name of Jesus, or else. And how do they pray? Lord, give us more boldness. It's interesting to note what they did not pray for. They did not pray that God would remove the evil leaders from office. They did not pray that God would remove the threats against them. They did not even pray that God would protect them from persecution or death. Now, you can pray all those things, but I'm just noting that that's not what they did. What did they pray for? What was their petition? They prayed for that boldness in the face of the threats. They prayed that they would continue to speak God's word and that Jesus would be at the center of it in his power and authority. They prayed that God would perform signs and wonders in their midst. In their prayer, they do not pray against their persecutors. They pray for boldness and faithfulness in their witness. Can we honestly pray that kind of prayer? What happens when you pray that kind of prayer? Because it's easy to get caught up in, in, wanting, you know, in wanting God to deal with those who persecute us. You know, we want to we dole out the judgment. We want to see it done. Because what have they done to us? And yet, there's a better way. And so when we can pray this way, it leads to this. And it's fine, my final point this morning, the product of missional prayer. We find the product, the result of their prayer, in verse 31, the last verse. When they had prayed, the place in which they gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and continue to speak the word of God with boldness. Their prayer was answered. They prayed they would speak the word of God with boldness, and that's exactly what they did. Why? Because they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And I don't want us to miss connecting these dots, so stick with me here. Some churches will say, eh, we don't really concern ourselves with doctrine. We just want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we want to do uh, the work of God. We don't really concern ourselves with theology. So we just, all we want is the filling of the Spirit. Well, here's the truth that we can draw from Acts chapter 4. Authentic, genuine, legitimate, Holy Spirit filling and empowerment is rooted in strong, rich, theological foundation. Let me say this another way. We are fooling ourselves to totally disregard scripture, or to disregard theology and say, we're going to go for this Holy Spirit power, pleasing message that's going to make people feel good. Now consider, in this passage alone, all of the doctrines that they address, the doctrine of divine sovereignty, of God, the doctrine of creation, of inspiration of the scripture, of substitution, and of predestination. These are all weighty and deep areas of theology. But it's when we are rooted 
in the fertile soil of these weighty doctrines that the power of the Spirit will empower us and will fill us. Now I'm going to share a quick story before I close here from the church where I served as an associate before. And so maybe, uh, maybe there are others out here that feel the same way today, and so I'm just pointing this out as, as an expression. But when I, uh, I got a, a rare an occasional chance to preach there. And I remember an, a deacon there came up to me one Sunday and he said, why do you preach so long? He said, you should be done in 18 minutes. Now, shortly afterwards, good, I I'm glad for that expression. That makes me feel a little bit better. <laughs> but so shortly after, the senior pastor left and as they were kind of calling people not to, to calling people to come in to preach, getting people to preach, it was laid out, you have 18 minutes. Now maybe, you don't have to confess it to me, this isn't, there's no need for confession here, but maybe you found yourself since I've been here saying, man, he preaches way too long. You know, maybe you wish that I'd be done in 20 minutes. I've heard people, not here, but I've heard people say, anything you can say, you should be able to say in 20 minutes. And maybe I could. But we are a Bible teaching church. And the more time that we, we spend mining the depths of Scripture, the better off we're going to be. Amen. So why do you think in churches, pastors, and maybe other leaders, continue to pound the drum of get in the Word? If you've read through the Bible 20 times, Go for 21. If you've never read through the Word completely, start today if you want, or start in January. Ask questions. Dig in. I, you know, one of the things I was so encouraged by, I'm trying to remember if it was back, I think it was in February when we came, when we came up here, and you guys were, everybody was just kind of, uh, excited about what you had just finished. You had been going through a series on Revelation. Uh, I think in your, and on a, in a Wednesday night study, those of you that had been involved, and just involved in that, and just listening to, there was just excited chatter going back and forth, and it was just pleasing to me to hear it. I didn't need to engage in any of it. And frankly, there's, it's a church. I, I don't need to be engaging in all of that conversation with you after you've done it. You know, share that with others and have discussion and sharpen one another. But I want this church, and I know, I know that you do too, we want this to be focused on the inspired, inerrant Word of God. And that we long to be Spirit-filled, Spirit-empowered, and Spirit-controlled people. And that we are on mission daily. That we are looking every moment of our day for the people that are coming across our paths. That live in our neighborhoods. That maybe don't have a place to celebrate holidays with. Things that we might overlook because perhaps our lives have been not so messy. Our God is not small. He's huge. In fact, as we know, he's eternal. He doesn't, he doesn't get scared. He doesn't run around and fret about what's coming next. He's not surprised. Nothing catches him off guard. In fact, everything that is at work, it, 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 this is a promise, this is an encouragement to me, all of the things that happen are part of a predetermined plan. And not just any predetermined plan, it's God's plan. So out of this truth, we have the capability and the opportunity to pray like Peter and John for this boldness. Every day I'm praying for you guys. Not always every day by name, but sometimes by name. God, give them boldness. Give them a hunger to take the word and not just let it sit here on a Sunday morning, but to go out and do it. So let's pray this way.
Let's pray like they prayed. Because we are reminded that if the glory of God through salvation of sinners is what we desire. Do we desire that? then this is how we must pray. Pray for that boldness, and then do so and go forth. Let's pray.